Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for taking out time. So good to have you. Sure. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> we know that history biology is a very, you know, diverse subject, and um, an origin of life is in itself is such a huge question that humanity has ever asked. So I actually wanted to inspire people by telling stories of people like you, that how you can actually come from a very different background and still help humanity to answer these kinds of questions. You know, you can answer this question as a, as a biologist and you can answer this question as a geochemist. And you tell me that, what is your science story? What inspired you to become a scientist and an and, and astrobiologist? My science journey started at a pretty young age. So when I was a kid, I, like most kids, was very taken by things like the aquarium and the zoo. And um, I was kind of one of those kids who, at like six years old, had an answer already for what she wanted to be. And I wanted to be a marine biologist. So I wanted to study fish and dolphins and just marine life in general. And uh, I took that pretty seriously because that kind of was my answer. The whole I know that that changes a lot for some people, but for me, it was marine biologist, marine biologist. I was kind of known as the kid who wanted to be a marine biologist. <laughs> and um, I did my high schooling in Chicago, Illinois, uh, and they have a fantastic aquarium there called the Shed Aquarium. And I got involved. I was lucky enough to do an internship there and kind of see behind the scenes what it's like to be a marine biologist who works in an aquarium. Um, and that, I think that was the reason I ultimately ended up going into biology is because of my love for marine biology and my desire to be a marine biologist. Um, I was very lucky. I got to do research projects as a high school student through my involvement with the Shed Aquarium. So I got to do some really cool experiments in the Bahamas. And so I think that very much shaped my path towards becoming a biologist. Um, but when I was applying to go to school, I decided that I maybe just wanted to do general biology because I wasn't sure, you know, I'd, I'd focused so long on marine biology, maybe just other kinds of biology might be just as interesting. So I ended up starting my undergrad as a just general biologist, kind of leaning towards zoology, getting the animal thing. Um, but then I took, you know, in my third or fourth year, I took a, a molecular biology course and that just blew my mind. Um, and so I decided to change my major. I went into molecular biology more than like the zoology animal science path. And so um, I joined a research lab. I was studying, you know, just very simple genetics, molecular biology. And then um, I had to think about what I wanted to do next. And um, I was approached by one of the professors who had a connection with this program where you can learn how to be a stem cell biologist. <laughs> So, you know, at this point, you know, when you're young, you think, oh, everything interests me. You know, everything you learn becomes the new thing you want to do. And that was very much my state of mind. I said, yeah, well, yeah, of course I want to do stem cell biology. So as part of that program, I joined a research lab. And this was the first time I was actually doing my own projects. And I was studying stem cell biology in the context of cancer, trying to understand the role of stem cells in cancer. And I did that. And I thought that that was going to be my my future was going to be a stem cell biologist. I would continue in this. Um, and I don't know what happened. At some point in this research lab, I was just, you know, doing my routines and doing all my molecular biology experiments. And all of a sudden, I started thinking about really strange questions about, you know, why, why are cancer cells a thing? You know, why are stem cells a thing? You know, why are cells the way they are in the, in the first place? Why is life the way it is in the first place? How did life get started? And we you know where does it, it just, I went down this rabbit hole in my mind that I don't really know what, what it was inspired by, but just kind of asking new kinds of questions about the things I was seeing. And I remember just sitting at my lab computer one day and just typing in, you know, origin of life or something like that. And the NASA Astrobiology Institute website came up and that was just a big light bulb for me because I was like, oh wow, all these questions I've kind of been asking myself as like a weird tangent to what I'm studying is an actual field of research that's funded by NASA. And I was like, okay, that's it. So, so that was kind of challenging because I suddenly found myself doing things that were different from my interests. And so I started to try to figure out what to do. I ended up doing a master's after that because I wanted more time to explore my interests. And so I ended up doing a master's in synthetic biology, um, 
which is how I learned how to manipulate the structures of life, not just study them and try to gather information about them, but actually use that to transform life and make it do stuff that we want it to do. And that gave me time to learn these skills and search for my PhD programs until I found my current lab where I study the origin of life from a very different perspective that I would have ever imagined. And that's from the perspective of chemistry. So now I actually don't do any biology at all, even though all my training before this had been in biology, I now do almost no biology whatsoever. So yeah, so my path has been <laughs> very, very convoluted. It started with fish and then with animals and then with just biology in general to molecular biology, to synthetic biology and now chemistry. So yeah. <laughs> that is actually a very wonderful story and a very wonderful and a unique journey, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And interestingly, almost every almost every person I know who studies the origin of life to date has a similar story. Very few people I know were straight, you know, as a linear path from yeah. what they yeah. were studying, perhaps what they were learning in school to where they are now studying this really big question. It's almost always like that. People have very interesting backgrounds. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I, I'm talking to many people these days about origin of life. Uh, I have to take like interview seven different people who are working on origin of life and each one of them including you has a very different and a unique kind of story to share with people and i think that yeah is, that is very wonderful and that is very unique yeah i think so too because i think when those people start to interact and intersect in the context of trying to answer this question it, it, the, the diversity of perspectives that's shaped you know by this really non-linear path is is super valuable and i think it's um yeah i don't know why why origin of life draws people who've had very convoluted paths but i think it's really fun how as a chemist or as a or maybe as a biologist you are trying to answer the origin of life question mm, okay yeah so well i guess the first the, the broadest answer is we're trying to do that empirically. We're actually trying to do experiments in the lab where we actually ask questions about, you know, what conditions you need for the origin of life, what kinds of behaviors kind of come first, you know, what do you, what do you need in this kind of ladder of towards the life as you know it, what's, what needs to happen in order to, for you to get that. And so we're answering that very pragmatically. We're running experiments, but we're also doing that with theory. So we have a, a theoretical branch in our group that run computer simulations based on hypotheses that we have about what's needed for life to get started. Um, but the, the really important part is for us is going in the lab and trying to test these empirically and seeing what's possible. So we're using empirical and theoretical approaches to study the origin of life. And in particular, the question we're trying to ask is, you know, how do you get lifelike behaviors, things that we associate with life, things that we value in our definitions of life, things like self-reproduction right being able to persist in spite of perturbations in spite of things happening in the environment how do you get things that can start to evolve and become more complex um, without those things existing in the first place so how do you get evolution without a prior evolutionary process right so we're really trying to get to the very very origin of lifelike behaviors that we think were important for complexification for life as we know it to appear in all of its glory but starting from the very beginning starting from the bottom so um you know we have our hypotheses about how that happened we have models to try to explain what you need for those behaviors to to, to take place things like what kinds of molecules you need what kinds of ingredients do you need what kinds of temperature conditions what kinds of atmospheric conditions and then we try to mimic those in a laboratory setting and look for the onset of these key behaviors and so like i said we're taking a very pragmatic approach we're not just hypothesizing about what is needed where if we have an idea if someone in the community has an idea we want to be able to do it we want to see if it works um, so that's kind of our approach is just to start from the very beginning and ask you know questions about these fundamental processes of life how those get started um, and get in the lab and, and try it out this is actually a very unique and a different approach towards the region of life Origin of life is actually a subset of questions, and you know, there are questions within questions. Um, yeah, you're right, because the origin of life, you know, can be anything from the origin of cells to the origin of, you know, multicellular life to the origin of certain processes, you know, things like translation and the genetic code. 
Um, and it can also mean the actual origin, you know, the transition from non-living to the first living or semi-living entities. And that's really what we're interested in, um, is that very first step. Because I think it, as so far, it seems to be the furthest from being resolved because it's the most difficult to study, just because we don't really have any good understanding of how that happens. We don't have um, examples we can watch unfold. We don't have things we can observe and go, oh, that, okay, that's how it happens. So we're really trying to observe a process that we, we can't, we've never seen before. Um, and that makes it very difficult, but I think um, it's probably one of the most mysterious parts of all of this is how, how it starts at the very beginning. And that's what we're interested in. I'm interested in origin of life. I, I always wanted to know that, mm -hmm. you know, First, I started off as that what is life and what is the meaning of life. Then, you know, I just kept exploring it and, and I discovered astrobiology and that was it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, yeah. Yeah, I think it just kind of, it, it's crazy because a lot of people don't know how much of a whole scientific effort there is to try to understand this. Most people think it's kind of like a weird thing that some people explore on the side you know but we because it's such a scientifically difficult question to answer no one's taking it seriously you know yeah. um but i think once people realize like oh no there is a significant number of people worldwide you know who are dedicated to answering this question despite how difficult it is just because they're so inspired by the implication right and the the, the like the deep existential need to understand our origins that I think for people, it's just like mind blowing. And so that's, I think that's really cool that you're teaching such young students about, about these kinds of questions. Cause I know, you know, it took me until almost starting my master's degree to even know that this was something that you could study scientifically, you know? And I think that um, it might inspire some students to come into science because of those questions, as opposed to already being in science and discovering, oh, this is a whole other kind of questions I could explore. So I think that's really cool as a potential driving force for people to come in when they realize that they can turn this really deep personal question into an actual scientific career. So I think that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, my last question is that, you know, how would you define your research to someone who has no background, science background? Sure. Yeah, so I guess I can start with what I feel the origin of life means, because I think it, it definitely explains why, why I'm doing what I'm doing in my research. So for me, the origin of life is the origin of lifelike behavior, <laughs> right? So if we think about what distinguishes non-living chemistry from living chemistry, there are a few things that we can point to. And the two that I like to focus on are this ability to sustain one's growth, which some people call self-reproduction or self-propagation, there are a number of terms, or even just growth. Um, and the other one is evolution, right? So I think pretty much most people agree that non-living chemistry can't really do those things. They can't, not in any meaningful way at least. And so what we're really looking for is how you get those behaviors to emerge spontaneously by themselves, right, without design from non-living mixtures of chemicals. So that's, to me, the, the origin of life itself is the origin of those two processes, and not everyone agrees with me. So um, what I'm doing in my lab is, tr is trying to do exactly that. It's starting with chemicals, uh, aspects of an early earth environment that may have been present in an environment, and trying to find conditions under which you get things like self-reproduction evolution to kind of come out by themselves. And the way that we think that happens is through a, a key process that's a very fancy word in chemistry called autocatalysis, and it's just a way to describe a feedback loop. So where when you, when you form a compound and a compound exists, it can now facilitate more of that compound forming. Right, so you kind of get this amplification and this growth, essentially. So that's one way in which simple chemicals can start to display one of the living features, which is self-reproduction or growth. Um, and then, you know, in a, if you open your mind a little bit and you, you can accept that evolution doesn't necessarily need to happen in the exact same way as it does in life as we know it, you know, using DNA and genetic polymers and information transfer, um, we think that a, a kind of a rudimentary form of evolution can happen in those systems that can kind of grow in this feedback. So we kind of have a model, an idea for how chemicals can start to display these behaviors very early on and how that might set up the systems to become more and more complex and more and more like what we see in cellular life today. So 
basically we just assemble little mini early earths. We, we use uh, chemicals, um, things that you know might accumulate on an early earth through things like Miller-Urey type discharges. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of that or hydrothermal vents or d delivery from comets and meteorites. And we kind of assemble this soup, right? Like this almost like oceanic broth full of these building blocks. We add minerals because we think minerals had a very important role at the origin of life in terms of providing catalysis and facilitating some reactions between these building blocks that might not, might not have been possible otherwise. We mimic other aspects like the temperature, the light, um, the presence of oxygen or the absence of oxygen rather. And we mix those together and we try to look for evidence of autocatalysis, so these feedback loops. And then we, we use an analog of what's called experimental evolution, which you may have heard of, that's used in, in biology for things like evolving microbes in the laboratory, to actually look for systems that are able to evolve. So we basically just dilute the system. So once we have these little vials, um, we let them sit for a little while, you know, just to kind of give things time to react. And then at the end of that, we take a little bit of the mineral and the soup and we transfer it to a new vial that contains fresh food, basically fresh food and fresh mineral. And the idea is that if a system appears that, that can reproduce greater than the rate at which we're diluting it out and forcing it out of existence, then we have found a system that can kind of persist in spite of this environmental pressure and adapt as a result of it. So we're basically kind of deploying this weird experimental evolution thing, except not on biological systems, on chemical systems. And the thing we're looking for is evidence of evolution. So that's what we're doing. That's the whole, that's all of our lab does basically. We just test different conditions. You know, we add certain molecules. Oh, maybe we add ATP or not, or maybe we use this mineral or a different mineral, or we try to simulate Titan conditions. Um, and, but the procedure is the same. We look for evidence of self-propagation and evolution as a result of this kind of chronic dilution that we do. So that's, that's our research. And um, yeah, it, I think it's tailored to our model for the origin of life that you can get these very key behaviors emerge spontaneously in this chemical setting rather than a biological one. This is actually very great. Uh, Good, so so any questions? Yeah, sorry, that was a lot. If you have any questions about that, feel free to, <laughs> to answer the follow up. No, no, um, that is absolutely fine. Um, thank you so much, Lena, for taking our time. Um, yeah, no problem. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>